talking. So I am Heidi Garvin from Grow Nebraska. And for those of you who don't know, Grow Nebraska is a 501c3 nonprofit. And our whole purpose is to help you with your promotion and to raise awareness about your business. So part of the way that we do that is we host free trainings like these. So our third Thursday training is the third Thursday of every month and we bring in experts from across the state and across the country to help teach you ways that you can promote your business. Um, these trainings would not be possible without the help of some of our amazing sponsors. And today we are absolutely thrilled. We have Adams Bank and Trust uh, is the sponsor today. So Josie, I'm going to let you tell us a little bit about Adams Bank and Trust. Hello, thank you. Uh, so Adams Bank and Trust is a family owned regional bank. We're located in Nebraska and we also have uh, branches in Kansas and in Colorado. So we have a, a, a fairly significant footprint. Uh, the thing about Adams Bank and Trust that uh, is most applicable to today's topic is that we, um, being a family owned bank, we understand small business and that is a passion of ours. We love to bank small businesses and we've really been able to, um, throughout our years of business, we've been able to really tailor our solutions for um, every kind of small business um, that, that is really um, present in Nebraska. So uh, we really support and uh, champion Grow Nebraska's uh, mission, and we're just proud to support them. And I hope that you all get some good information today on your webinar. Awesome. Well, thank you so much, Josie. We appreciate all that you do for Nebraska businesses, and we are so thankful that you are our sponsor today. Thank you, Heidi. Awesome. Then, as we are a member organization, we do like to feature some of our members. So this month, we are super excited. Our featured member is Nebraska Life Magazine. They've been a proud Grow Nebraska member since 1999, and we love giving them promotion. So we have Beth is here to uh, tell us a little bit about a special opportunity that we have with Nebraska Life right now. everybody today. My name is Beth with Nebraska Life Magazine and just wanted to hop on really quick and talk with you about the unique opportunity that we're working on with Grow Nebraska. In our Nebraska Life Magazine, we have a, a Nebraska made product section that's all about Nebraska made products. Um, anything from the chocolates over at Master's Hand Candy to specific cheeses and different boots over from Sand Hill Boot Company. Um, and this is something that is specific only to those Nebraska businesses. And we've been working with Grow Nebraska to then have Grow be a part of it and also work with us to increase the publicity for their members as well as Nebraska products all over Nebraska. Pricing for being within our Nebraska made section with the Grow Co-op all depends on how many people are involved and want to participate. Um, depending on how big of a size of ad and then with how many participants the more participants that we have, the bigger ad and more of a message to get across to all of our subscribers. Awesome. And so if you are interested in that, please go ahead and contact Grow Nebraska at info at grownebraska.org. We'll let you know how you can participate in this amazing opportunity. And so this is for their holiday editions. They have a huge subscriber list, so if you want to get your name out there through Nebraska Life Magazine, this is a great opportunity for you. We're also thrilled Nebraska Life Magazine is going to be joining us at our State Fair store. So if you are going to Grand Island for the State Fair between August 24th and September 3rd, make sure to come visit us in the Pinnacle Bank Expo building. So we 
I have a whole new design layout for our store. We're bringing in tons of new, innovative Nebraska products, and we are just thrilled to be able to introduce you to them. So I hope you stop by. I hope you get to check out Nebraska Life and all the other wonderful members we have participating. And now, for the reason we are all here, I am going to turn it over to Steve Molly from Molly Marketing. And Steve, I have had the pleasure of working with you for years. He is an absolute expert when it comes to everything from website marketing to social media marketing. He is absolutely phenomenal. So Steve, I'm going to let you take it away. Perfect, I appreciate that. Thanks for having me on here. Let me share my screen and just to confirm, can you see the presentation? Yes, we can. Perfect. Okay. Let's dive on in. I know when we were talking about this a couple of weeks ago, I had you forward on some of the most common asked questions when it came to marketing. A lot of it came down to current trends. A lot of it came down to what works, what doesn't work um, here in the marketplace right now, um, and just how things are moving and how things are changing. And so I wanted to do kind of a deep dive into a lot of that. Uh, as well as have a lot of just practical things that you can take and you can implement here uh, pretty quickly and where we got some of this experience from and some of the testing that we've done as well to kind of get across on it. So the old adage is that 50% of your marketing is wasted. We don't know exactly which 50% it is. I just wanted to kind of dive into that a little bit more. I guess to kind of get kicked off, uh, there's me and my beautiful family, or was me and my family here about three years ago at this point in time. I felt like I was living in a sorority house. And my wife, then I had two beautiful daughters, and we even had a female dog. And then here, just uh, about a couple years ago now, I finally had my boy, finally got my son, um, and uh, finally have a kid that actually kind of looks like me too, which is kind of fun and entertaining, especially as it gets older and older. My contact information is up here. Feel free to ship me an email, give me a call. If there's any questions you might have about some of this stuff, um, I know as we go through it, um, we can cover quite a bit of material. Um, and maybe it's one of those things you go to start implementing it. You get confused on something or need a little bit of help. Feel free. Um, I do not have my law degree. So for that reason, I can't charge you 250 bucks for a 15-minute phone conversation or a quick email reply. I'm more than happy to really kind of help you out if you get stuck or have any questions on, on what we're going through and what we'll cover overall. Um, just a quick little glance. Some different clients that we've worked with, some different brands we've worked with, anything from Lincoln, the uh, Convention and Visitors Bureau, to Western Nebraska Tourism Coalition, North Black Kearney, uh, did some work with Ocean Robbins, which would be a story that I might get into in a bit. Um, he's actually the grandson of Baskin Robbins, and uh, he remembers as a kid in the 1970s actually swimming in his grandpa's pool, and his pool was shaped just like the Baskin Robbins logo, which I thought was kind of kind of interesting. Did a lot of work with the state and the uh, the eclipse that came through here last year and anything to the mutual of Omaha. Um, so we've kind of ran the gamut of working with bigger organizations, small organizations, Ma and Pa, whatever it may be, and seeing really what kind of works with that. What I want to lead off with is the first client that we ever actually had on Shark Tank. Um, and he appeared on Shark Tank year in uh, 2017, March of, or May, excuse me, of 2017. And so when we got the phone call, that he was going to film in front of sharks. Obviously, we were pretty excited. And for those of you that have seen Shark Tank, you know how it works out. Um, you get in front of five sharks, you pitch your idea, um, you ask for a certain amount of money, and you're giving up some equity, and then they just start pouncing on you, asking all kinds of questions. They want to know your numbers. They want to know your profits, your number of customers, your cost of goods sold, um, expansion, what marketing looks like. And so when our client Pavlock, and Manish is the owner of Pavlock, when he came to us, this would have been back in September of 2016, that's when he came to us. He said, hey guys, I got an opportunity to film in front of the shark. Um, I need some information from you because we're running a lot of his content and his marketing at that point in time. And you know, came down to you know, just overall cost and investment and ROIs and things like that. So we helped him prep for it. Well, it's interesting what Pavlock is. Pavlock is actually kind of like a Fitbit in a way, but it helps you break bad habits. How it helps you break that habit is it'll literally shock you if you are doing something bad. Uh, if you are biting your nail, it'll know it and it'll shock you. If I'm a smoker, my arm is going up and down like I would if I was smoking a cigarette, it would shock me. 
Uh, I'm a smoker and my wife knows I'm trying to quit smoking. She can actually put this app on her phone and shock me if she sees me um, smoking. You know, people use it to lose weight, to wake up in the mornings, um, all kinds of different habits. It's really kind of a cool device. So he went and filmed in September of 2016. And since this device helps you break a bad habit, we figured for him to err, it'd probably be in January. New Year's resolutions, we're making changes, we're going to adapt new habits, those type of things. Um, and I guess just as a heads up, about 70% of the people that film in front of the sharks, their episodes air. So about 30% of um, people that film their episodes don't air. And so January comes, and generally if you are going to make the, the, you know, make TV, is you won't know until maybe about 10 days prior. They try to keep it as under wraps as possible. And so what happened in January, we're getting excited for this. He never got a heads up that his episode was in air. Like, all right, well, maybe it's a February. February comes and goes, never hear anything. March comes and goes, never hear anything. So at that point in time, we're like, all right, well, maybe he's part of the 30% that films but never actually reaches um, TV. Well, what happened may have been May of, you know, like the 2017, about May 10th or so, is we get a, a, a phone call from Manish, the owner. He's like, hey, guys, I'm going to be on Shark Tank. I'm going to be on Shark Tank here in 10 days. I want you guys to run a bunch of ads after the episode airs. I'm like, all right, perfect. I'm like, what do they say? He's like, I can't tell you. I'm like, that's fair. I'm like, I know you can't tell us if you got invested in or not invested in. But like, what are some these common language patterns? What do they comment about it? What do they like? What do they dislike? You know, what was the feedback? What was the experience? He's like, I can't tell you any of that. I'm like, okay, so you want us to run ads uh, for you being on Shark Tank, which is great, but don't really have any feedback or direction on exactly where to go, but we can figure it out. So as the dates got closer, we found out, or realized, I should say, that he was going to be on the season finale of Shark Tank. So we sit down and we start watching the episode. I actually have quite a few, uh, quite a bit of our family up in town for it. So we're watching the episode, and as the episode goes on, we realize he's going to be the last person on during the season finale. So once we realize he's going to be the last person on during the season finale, we knew it can go one of two ways. It was going to go really, really phenomenal, and everybody got up and do group hugs and cry, or the complete opposite and just be a train wreck. Well, unfortunately, it was the complete opposite and ended up being a bit of a train wreck. Um, it's one of those things that he invented this because he has really bad ADD. And so he used it to shock himself, to get himself refocused on whatever he was trying to get done. Well, you put him in front of five sharks who right off the bat start really attacking this. He was bouncing back and forth, didn't know what to do, didn't know what to say. He came across really as a, a complete idiot um, and a jerk, to really kind of put it nicely is Mark Cuban right away called him a con, um, a fraud, and a bunch of them were just really kind of going after not only him, but almost like bickering amongst themselves, which was made for entertaining TV. You know, unless obviously you were niche in the middle of it. He was bouncing back and forth, not knowing what to say. When he would say things, like I said, it just didn't come across the right way. Plus, it's edited for TV. His total time in front of the Sharks was about 45 minutes, and it edited down to about an eight-minute segment. Well, at the end of it, he did actually get an offer. He got an offer from Mr. Wonderful. I don't remember exactly what the offer was. Uh, it was fair. Uh, but Manish was like, hey, let me think about this. Uh, can I call somebody in order to talk to him about it? And Mr. Wonderful was like, no, you can't. Um, I want an answer, and I want an answer now. And so Manish was like, you know, I'm really trying to change the world, change bad habits with people. I'm really trying to make a positive impact. I feel like you're in it just for the money. We're not a good match. The answer is no, I'm not going to take your money. Well, the next five to six words out of Mr. Wonderful's mouth was F you, get the F out of here, cut to black, roll credits, our ads go live, right then and there. And so our ads are live. And there's people online that are just bashing Manish, bashing the product, again, calling him the con, uh, con artist and the fraud, just like Cuban did. And they're really, really going after him, which was interesting. It's a lot of times when you go and you appear on Shark Tank, you'll get a 30% bump in sales, regardless if you get funded or not. It's about a 30% bump in sales. He actually saw about a 30% decrease in sales because it hit home so hard. But the reason why I bring it up, because it segues into everything else I'm talking about, is human behavior. 
So what happened is these people got online, they made all kinds of comments, his sales plummeted. However, because they're online, we can retarget them, we can follow up with them, we can give them good content, they can learn more about the product. Um, again, we're just retargeting them and being a part of that natural buying cycle. You fast forward 30 days after his episode aired, he ended up seeing a 42% increase in sales. So it comes down to, and the lesson here is it's not so much what people say, it's what people do. And I'm much more interested in people's behavior than what they say that they are going to do. Because we're, we are irrational creatures and we act in different ways. And so that's what we're always, we are always focusing on. That's what we're always tracking. That's what we're always looking for is how are people actually behaving? And let's put together marketing pieces based on how people actually behave versus what they say they're probably going to do. So what that has allowed us to do, and we've been blessed with this over the last 12 months, we have tracked over $6 million in ad spend. Um, this is online as well as offline. And to be able to see what works, what doesn't work, what's resonating the most in the, in the marketplace. The way that I look at us managing the $6 million in ad spend, a lot of us do a lot of testing, see a lot of trends, and then be able to take a lot of those trends and be able to educate and you know, apply it to our other clients or just like this on a webinar, at a seminar, those type of things. We've had some clients have spent $150,000 a one month on just Facebook. We have other clients that might spend 300 bucks a month. Those clients that spend the 150,000, we can take the exact same principles we use for them and drill it down to the ones that only spend 300 bucks. Uh, the ones with the higher tickets that allow us to do a lot more testing, but it works out really, really well uh, for us to be able to get narrowed in on the smaller clients and be able to take some of that information and relay it like that, just like that. So before I get too deep into this whole thing, I'll give you the uh, kind of the mission and why of our company, what we're looking for. So the big thing is we do a ton of stuff in tourism. Is that overall, when people think about Nebraska, they think about cornfields, they think about fat guys and overall, and that's a perception of what they have. What we're trying to do is really kind of showcase the beauty of what Nebraska has to offer. And that's why I love Grow Nebraska. Uh, and that's why I love Nebraska life. Is they both try to have that same type of impact. They have those same type of goals is to be able to take a look at what the, uh, the state really is like, not simply what they're trying to show off on, on TV. So what I want to be able to do is with that $6 million in ad spend, we learned a bunch of stuff over the last 12 months. So I want to drill down into the number one lesson we learned, um, talk a little bit about ecosystems and building this up. We'll also go deeper into case studies. How do you take this? How do you use this? How do you apply this? What does it really look like? Um, and then throughout, really kind of give you the best of. So that way you can have some good ideas. You can take, you can implement uh, what we talk about in marketing. Uh, feel free to take some of this and repurpose it. If you want to take it and call it your own, I have no issues with that whatsoever. Feel free to do whatever it takes to kind of make a good positive impact on your company. So taking a look at everything that we've launched um, and tracked, specifically is we've learned one very, very valuable lesson. What it comes down to is people aren't searching for you or your product or your service most of the time. What's happening is people are consuming content and they stumble upon what you have to offer. They're consuming content through Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, Snapchat, blogs, just news articles, just content watching videos online between YouTube and Hulu and Netflix and places like that is that they are just watching this content, consuming this content. And then every once in a while they see an ad and it feels like they, they, you know, kind of stumble upon you. The reason why I have it in, in quotes is that it's much more of a strategy than just happened to be in front of them. So take a look at online content. 36 out of every 60 seconds on a phone is actually social media based. Uh, the average person spends almost six hours per day on just digital itself. If you want to take a look at phone usage, I think people, um, all the different reasons why people use the phone, I think making phone calls is actually number six on the list right now, which is really pretty crazy if you think about it. So like I said, where people are at, content finds them. We consume a ton of content in today's day and age, and strategically, you can place the right type of content in front of them. A good example of this is tanking. Uh, we did this for North Platte. We've done this for you know, numerous organizations. But this case study is out of North Platte. 
Um, if you went to Google about two years ago, um, and one of the big targets we have for tanking is to get people from Colorado to Nebraska, get them on our rivers and have them go tanking. I and mean, it's a completely unique experience. I don't know if any of you on the call have done it. Uh, when I first learned about it, I thought it was completely kind of hillbilly to a certain extent, but it is a blast. You know, you get in a big horse tank, horse trough, you put a bunch of lawn chairs kind of around it, a cooler, your favorite beverage in the middle, and then you just go for a two to four hour flow. And it really is a pretty good time. So if you, you know, rewind a couple of years and you're in Colorado, there is not much demand at all of people going to Google and typing in tanking Nebraska. They didn't know tanking existed. So what we ended up doing is putting together a campaign and hitting them up where they were at naturally. They'd be able to see some ads on tanking, read some content on tanking, what tanking is all about, how you do tanking, places to tank, um, different ways to have fun kind of in the water. So put together all this content for them and people were consuming it. Over 7,000 people were talking about it on just the North Platte ads, visit North Platte ads in a short amount of time. And people in Colorado were the most engaged. So you look at the end of that tourism season, I think the search demand for tanking in Colorado went up like 4,000%. It just had a huge demand. Because if you think about it, if you find out something, you're interested in something, a product, a service, a place, it doesn't matter what it is, the way you find out more information about it is you go to Google. You type in Google, you know, whatever you're trying to find out, and Google will give you all kinds of results. And I bring up Google specifically. Um, so Google dominates, this is no surprise to anybody, but Google dominates the search world. When I say dominates, they own over 80% of the market when it comes to search. Bing and Yahoo or whatever they're called here at this point in time own roughly between 8 to 10%. So again, Google dominates, and that's the reason why we always focus on Google and the other ones will kind of follow through. So again, if you're interested in anything, where you're going to find out more information on that to help you make a buying decision is you're going online to find out about it. And so that's why we track the Google and, and the trends. There we go. The moral of the story is if you're waiting for people to search you out, you really are at the whim of everybody else. You will simply just capture whatever is left over to kind of like that dog in the, in the photo here. And at the end of the day, whatever happens, happens. And so it used to be that adage, build it and they will come. Make it, make it come. Well, you've got to be strategically in front of these people in order for them to even know that you exist in order for them to make that next step. So what do you do? What we take a look at, uh, and this is what we encourage you to do the same way, is supply them with value and content they didn't even know that they desired. Um, each one of us as business owners or marketers or whoever it may be, we have different stories. We have different experiences. We have a different level of expertise. It's interesting if I you know, was in a physical place, a lot of times I'd ask people who in this place you know, are experts in what they do. Now, I've done this throughout the state of Nebraska, and so it doesn't matter if we get 10 people in the room, we got 60 people in the room. When I ask the question, are you an expert in what you do? In Nebraska, you might have 5% to maybe 10% of the audience raise their hand. Maybe. The thing I love about Nebraskans is we are very, very humble people. The thing that drives me nuts about Nebraskans at times is we are very, very humble people. And because of that, I am a firm believer if you've been doing what you've been doing for even a couple of years, you're an expert compared to just about everybody else that's in the marketplace. And it's one of those things that we need to take advantage of that we need to really fully realize the information you have is extremely valuable, interesting to a lot of people, and you can really teach and lead people through it. So what does that look like? The biggest thing is we always take a look at building an ecosystem. Uh, what we want to be able to do is ask for soft commit and don't talk about yourself too early. And I'll get into more details about this. But the biggest thing in any type of relationship, online, offline, is soft commitments before you ask for a big commitment, before you really start talking about yourself too soon. So what it comes down to in sales, you know, it's tender versus marriage. It's getting on tender, swiping right, swiping left. You find somebody, you have a date on that very, very first date. In the first 15 minutes of that first date is asking them to marry you. 
It obviously doesn't make sense. That's not reality. However, there's way too many times in marketing, in business, in sales, hey, it's great to meet you. Now buy from me. You can trust me. I know you've only known about me, my product, my service, my whatever for about 10 minutes here. But hey, you can trust me. How about you buy from me now? How about you buy from me now? How about you buy from me now? And that's really what it comes across as. It's going from A to Z without having anything else in between. And so what we're looking at is a way to deliver value in between so they build up that relationship, they build up that trust. Just like you know, when you were dating before you got married, you built up that relationship and you built up a lot of that trust. So ideally when you went to go ask that person for their hand in marriage, um, that you knew what they were gonna say. So that's what we're looking at. Don't go from nice to meet you to buy from me, buy from me, buy from me, buy from me. A couple years ago, I came across this definition of a brand and I absolutely loved it. And so I keep it in a lot of my presentations that I give because I think it puts it perfectly and really takes this and throws it down um, very simply. It is a brand. It's putting, putting more deposits in people's equity bucket before you ask them to buy. Again, it's putting more deposits in people's equity bucket before you ask them to buy. What it is, it's building a relationship. It's making sure it's a two-way street, um, that you're giving, you're giving, you're giving, and then you're asking to receive. They've done a, uh, a bunch of research on this inside of huge companies, from Google to, to Facebook to attorneys to engineering firms, all kinds of stuff. And they've studied people, and they've studied the success of people. Um, success for them it kind of came down to job title, um, advancement opportunities, salary, those type of things instead of a instead of a corporation. And they looked at the most common factor of the people that were at the top that you know had the best job titles, the most responsibility, the best pay, those type of things. The one thing that was in common across all boards, from attorneys to engineers, um, to you know those startups in Silicon Valley, is that those personalities of those individuals is they were givers. They continue to give more, much more than they ever asked to receive on back. So we really want to take our marketing in that same direction. We want to be able to give, to give, to give, to give before we do ask for anything on back. So what we're looking for along that process is really soft commitments. You know, maybe they'll say yes to reading an article. Maybe they'll say yes for opting into your newsletter. Maybe they'll say yes to showing up at an event. Uh, maybe some of those smaller apps before they'll say yes to buying. So an online example, what this looks like potentially online. Is it maybe it's Facebook. Facebook, Instagram, being interchangeable, uh, but you take a look at a Facebook like, get them to like your page first. Get them then to watch a video. Now I'll get into specifics of this here in a second. Get them to even like a post, engage with one of your posts on Facebook or on Instagram. Then ask them to visit a page on your website. Once you, once they have visited a page on your website, retarget them to maybe a deeper page on your website. Retarget them to an area that you, they can get more information. Then step number six is ask them to book now, ask them to buy now, ask them to call you now, ask them to email you now, ask them to fill out this form so you get this contact info so you can follow up. So what we're looking at is six different steps in this online example. So the question is, you're asking them to take six steps. Isn't that super expensive? Well, let me kind of break it down. So I'm going to go over three different case studies here for you um, to kind of prove the point. Uh, the Great Nebraska Clips, or National Clips, that came through here August 21st of last year. Um, it was crazy that we are almost exactly a, a year away from that, from that happening. And it stretched from you know the East Coast all over the West Coast. So we ran a lot of the campaigns uh, for Nebraska for that on social media. So first we asked them to like the page. Uh, the page wasn't come to Nebraska and view the Eclipse in Nebraska, come to Grand Island and view the, the Eclipse. It was simply just information about the Eclipse period, why Eclipse are special, why, they're, why they are unique, what's happened in previous years or in Eclipse, when the last time actually came across you know, the entire United States. So we asked them to like the page. Then we asked them to engage with some of these content, some of these articles. Some, and when we're talking about this engagement, we're not talking necessarily about us writing a bunch of contents or blogs or anything like that. What we were talking about is sharing information. Uh, first here, we found articles anywhere from USA Today to Astronomers Magazine to Omaha.com to K 
places all over the place talking about the eclipse. And think about it on your side of it. And obviously, you, you're probably not an eclipse, but there's articles inside of your industry that people would find interesting that correlate to your industry. I'll get you some more examples here in a little bit. Then took a look at video views to get somebody to watch. Uh, this one was a 30 second video. It costs a third of a penny to get them to watch a 30 second video. And again, it's not a video that we created or that the state of Nebraska created. This is stuff that we were able to repurpose from other pieces of content. Other people created videos around the eclipse and talk about the eclipse. Now, obviously, we click back. We'd give credit where credit was due. We'd send traffic back to their site if people are interested, but allowed us to build up this engagement, some really good value. Then we gave them an article about the eclipse. They can go much deeper into it. The article might be why Nebraska is a, in the top three of the best places to view the eclipse and what that really looked like. And so, again, allow them to just find out that much more information. And then eventually, after they've gone through all of this, that's when we'd ask them to contact us. That's when we'd ask them to follow up. That's when we ask them, hey, come to Nebraska. You have to view the eclipse in Nebraska. So this whole process we're talking about, you do the math on it, it costs 78 cents. 78 cents for them to like a page, get engaged with some of your posts, watch part of a video, click and read an article, and then click back to find out more information on Nebraska and why they should view it here. The old school approach was, hey, Eclipse is coming through Nebraska, come check us out, book your hotel room, book your travel plans right now in Nebraska. That old school approach would cost you between two to four bucks every time you interacted. Not for the entire process, but literally every interaction if you're trying to go from look at me, buy from me. Another example, and it looks like in the presentation blown up, this isn't the, the best high resolution photo, but what this is, it's the, uh, the sandhill cranes on Grand Island. Um, in Grand Island Kearney area, there's over 500,000 cranes that come through. We did a program with Nebraska Fall IOI a couple of crane seasons ago. And it's the same story. Is we have them like a page, um, we then send them up some engagement, give them some good posts, give them some good articles to read, some good information about cranes, why they migrate, the direction they go, um, you know, the Washington Post has done some great articles on this. So again, it's not necessarily content that you have to create. It is that you can pull this content from numerous other places as long as you give credit where credit is due. It's great if you do have time and if you can create a blog, an article, whatever it may be, um, even like a longer blog once a month would be fantastic. There's enough news, there's enough sources, there's enough people talking about each one of our industries at this point in time is you can take that content and be able to put it in front of the, your followers, the people that do follow you. So ask them to click on an article, it costs 22 cents. Ask them to book now, to make their reservations now, it costs 41 cents. So total investment for them, 72 cents. And again, the old school approach was between two bucks to four bucks every single time that you interact with them. Another example, and Max Trick has given me permission to be able to share some of this stuff with you. It's a winery out in Lexington. And they do have a wine bar in Kearney now at this point in time too. But again, leading people through this content. Like the page, get engagement. One of the big pieces of engagement for them was uh, taking red wine and putting, um, or making a, you know, a cup of hot chocolate and putting red wine inside of the cup of hot chocolate. It sounds crazy, but it's fantastic. It tastes like a, uh, you know, a red velvet cupcake, if you will. It's great. We found an article. I don't remember who published it, but we found an article, and so we just shared the link to that article. People absolutely loved it. And so it cost three cents to get somebody to engage with us. If it costs three cents and get them to watch a video for a penny, so four cents overall for two points of engagement, we'll spend that money all day long in order to get people into our ecosystem in order for them to build an awareness, build a trust factor, start a relationship with us. Um, you know, again, it's, it's four cents. Then we created some articles on how you can use our wines or places they were gonna be, um, or just simply some good wine advice, how to cook with wine, that type of stuff. After we've taken them through those different steps, then we ask them for the wine club. We'd ask them to join the wine club. So for them, it was $1.59 for them to take them through all of those under the direct buy model, to get them to consider coming back, 
um, to the website or visit the website first, excuse me. So it'd be the first time they'd visit the website under the old model, because we'd split test this, it was $2.59. And that was one click, one interaction. Or again, if you lead them through a process, it becomes much, much cheaper. So again, we're asking them to take you know, upwards of six steps. Is that super expensive? And as you can see, time and time again, the answer is no. So we've changed up a lot of our content, a lot of our marketing. I'll get into more case studies and examples of this around what can we do to give people value first? How can we first get in front of them so they get intrigued on in what we have to offer before we ask them to buy, 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 buy. So with that being said, one of the best strategies um, is to take a look at the number one way to increase your marketing ROI. If any of you have seen me speak at different seminars across the state, is you've probably seen slides dedicated to this section how, time and time again over the last seven, eight years at this point. It's interesting um, with this, it hasn't really changed. Actually, I take that back, it has changed. The strategy remains the same. The results have continued to go up, 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 and up. So it's become that much more effective in today's marketing clutter, if you will. So it all comes down to education-based marketing. It's leading with value. You know, it's that teacher on the left-hand side of your screen. Um, versus that used car salesman on the right hand side of your screen. The used car salesman can tell you anything possible to get you in that car today because he knows once you drive off in that car today, you're probably never coming back. He'll probably never see you. So he'll do whatever it takes to get you to buy that car. That teacher, though, that teacher gives you value. She's taught you all kinds of stuff. Maybe it's not a teacher. I mean, think about it growing up. You probably had a, you know, a mentor, a coach, parent. Um, you know, a parent-like figure, anything along those lines that gave you a ton of value, and you're more than happy to reciprocate and give you them value back. And that's the thing is us as human beings is we are wired to reciprocate. So one of the big questions we get with education-based marketing is like, all right, we can do all this teaching, you can give them a ton of value, but aren't they going to go down the street and, you know, save 5% um, by using somebody else? And the answer is unequivocally no. Study after study after study after study has shown that price, when it comes to why people buy, price is at the top, sixth or seventh on the list. It might be the number one reason why they, what they vocalize, but again, I'm much more interested in behavior than simply what people say. But if you go down the true reasons why people buy time and time and time and time and time again, it comes down to customer service, comes down to support, quality of the product, proven track record, there's all things that come ahead of price. And so we're not competing on price. So what education-based marketing is in a nutshell, establish, establishing yourself or your company as the expert in the marketplace through education. Education-based marketing, it polls eight to 10 times better at this point in time than traditional product or service-based. Traditional products or service space is very much look at me, I'm great, I'm amazing type of marketing. It is the number one viewed piece of content online, education based. And the whole core behind this, again, is continuing to lead with value. So, a couple of quick examples, and we'll be able to move on. I think this is one that everybody can relate to is gyms, gyms and health clubs, is they all pretty much market the same. They all pretty much are like, hey, join us now. We'll waive any type of initiation fee, no setup. It's $10 a month, it's $20 a month, but it's a real cheap monthly commitment. And they all pretty much just try to market based on price. What we ended up doing was doing a uh, marketing campaign for a gym, and we removed price from the equation completely. What we noticed is the people that use the gym, who they really wanted to attract, was 35 to 54 year old men. 35 to 54 year old men are not necessarily trying to get six pack abs. They know they'll probably, if they never had them, they'll probably never get them at that point in their life. What they were much more interested in um, was literally being able to be active with their kids, being able to walk their daughter down the aisle when she first gets married, to be able to be healthy enough to interact with their grandkids, those types of things. That's what they were really kind of focusing on, and that's what they really wanted to have. So we changed the conversation away from the you know, waive your initiation fee. 
to here are a ton of different ways you can really cut your heart disease down by 56%. That could be going on 30 minute walks. That could be getting your heart rate between 120 to about 140 minutes or beats per minute and keeping them there for at least 15 minutes, three days a week. That's, you know, eat this food, don't eat this food. That's some exercises you can do at home that doesn't even require you to come into the gym. So we gave them all kinds of value on them. Because at the end of the day, if you look at just national standards, is only about 22% of people work out three to four days a week. Again, if I was in a physical place, I would ask the audience, you know, how many of you, let me think about this, how many of you work out three to four days a week consistently? We have 20 people on here. There's probably four of you who would do it consistently. But if I do the follow-up question, is how many of you on here know that you should work out three to four days a week? I can guarantee you every one of your hands will be going up. We all know it. We just don't have that driving reason to do it. And $10 a month is not a driving reason to do it. Being able to walk your daughter down the aisle, to be able to play with your grandkids, to be able to have energy throughout the day, those are reasons why. And so we're able to put together this campaign and we educate it. We educate it through direct mail, through uh, ads, we, um, print ads, as well as online ads. We did some videos. And when I'm talking about videos too, you can shoot some fantastic videos on your iPhone. You know, you don't need to have a full-fledged video crew in it. Uh, now, if you can afford a full-fledged video crew, fantastic, it can work out well, but it's not required. Your iPhone can shoot fantastic video, can capture some pretty good audio, and that's what we recommend really on that front. But we led them down through this process, and at the end of the day, their memberships really skyrocketed. There's another example we did with a car lot. We've done this for mechanics. We've done it for memberships. Like, um, you know, we've done it for all kinds of brick-and-mortar e-commerce clients, physical product clients. Is on the car side of it, you know, if you take in Lincoln, you have Husker Auto Group, and let's say you have Sidella. You take their ads on the Sunday paper. You take the logo off of one, put that logo on the other one, and it's going to look exactly the same. They all talk about we have the best selection, lowest prices. Best selection, lowest prices. What we end up doing with the car dealership is we would educate people about the whole car buying process. Is hey, these are literally the tricks a lot of people use, car people use in order to get you to you know, sign on the dotted line here today. Here's the math tricks they use to make you feel like you're getting a good deal or literally confuse you and you don't want to look dumb and so you end up getting into a deal you really don't want to have. Also gave information, literally a, there's a 1-800 number that you can call to figure out how much that dealership has invested in a new car. So that way you have a pretty good idea what you can get that car for. We gave them all kinds of ways to, to Increase the value of their trade-in. That was one of the headlines received 34% more for your trade. And so we talked about what the car dealer actually looks at when the trade comes through his door. You know, what they like, what they don't like. You know, they don't really care that much about a clean car. They can look past that pretty quick. It really comes down to the bones, the foundation. So we educated them. So when we worked with this car dealer, it was a big concern. It was the same comment I made earlier on. Well, great. You can give people all this information. You can teach people all this stuff. But again, I'm one of the eight car dealers on this major road. Why don't they just go down to my competitors? Like I stated, we are wired to reciprocate. Within three months, they started to see their sales really take off. Talking to the general manager of this place, what he really appreciated about it was when people came in, they were much more educated about the process. Since they were much more educated about the process, negotiations took a lot less time. Negotiations take a lot less time. That got his salespeople back out on the sales floor, if you will, and allowing them to sell that many more cars in a day. And so it was really able to leverage and push the entire company forward. So the big thing with this, and we take a look at it, is what can you do? Lead with articles, lead with insights. Um, use videos to tell stories. Videos are huge. Videos are fantastic. Like I said, uh, your iPhone, whatever kind of phone you have, can capture great enough video. If you don't like writing articles, do videos on that. If you don't like that, maybe look at just recording your voice potentially. Um, you know, give people out free guides to help them make better decisions. People love free guides, free downloads, um, just more education. Here's the top eight things you got to consider. People love checklists. Uh, there's a couple things that people love. Checklists is one of them. If you're in the food industry, 
people love recipes and how they can use your product inside of different recipes. Um, that's a huge one that will get you a lot of traction as well. But the moral of the story is be able to teach it every opportunity that you get. Teach again and again and again. Like I said, give again and give again and again and again, and then eventually come back and ask for the sale. Ask for that next step. So, some things you can do. Um, like I said, what I mentioned on this is that each network allows you to really kind of drill down if it's Google, if it's Facebook, if it's Instagram, if it's Snapchat, you know, anything that's online, is that everything is trackable online and we're able to get a lot of data online. So you can really hone in your audience really well. Like I said, we target based on behaviors and purchases, not what people find or state is interested. Um, I went to the Nebraska Travel Conference in last October, and one of the presenters brought up this example, which I loved, and so I'm repurposing it for my own. But for example, we're talking about what people say versus what they do, we're talking about their interests versus what they buy, what their behaviors show. Is I love to go skiing. I love to go in the mountains and go to different parts of Colorado, go skiing down, you know, have three, four days away, and it's fantastic. I absolutely love it. I am very interested in going skiing. Over the last seven years, every fall, we talk about, hey, this winter, we should go skiing. Every spring, we talk about, hey, last winter, we should have gone skiing. So I'm interested in it, but my behavior does not show that I'm actually active in it. And again, this has been going on for eight months or eight years. So I'd rather target somebody that shows they go skiing once a year, twice a year, 10 times a year, um, or maybe they just go skiing every other year than simply somebody that says they're interested but hasn't done anything for it. So that's what we're always looking for. So ways that you can really take and run with this in some other different medias besides obviously just online, brochures. Brochures are a fantastic way to educate people. Um, and not just about your, your, your product or your service, it's about the industry really as a whole and how you can kind of fit in and things that they can really do. So the biggest thing is answer what their number one challenge is right away. Why would somebody hire you? Why would somebody team up with you? Why would somebody buy your product or service? Answer that number one challenge question up front right away. You know what's in their mind. They might not vocalize it, but you know what's in their mind. Address it. Be able to move on. Uh, one thing with this is give them something they want to hold on to. Uh, there's an example I continue to use year after year, and it's TDK Lawn Service Base out of here in Lincoln. His stuff is ugly. And I'm talking about ugly, ugly. It is, he prints it off at home, it doesn't matter if it's a brochure, if it's a flyer or whatever, on just bright yellow paper. And all he ever uses is black font on top of it. No graphics, no design, no nothing. What happens when he hands all these things out is that people tend to hold on to this. Because what they do is that on the brochure itself, you put the checklist on one side of the brochure. In the springtime, you should do these five things to your yard. And in the fall time, you should do these five things for your yard. In the brochure, it talks a little bit more detail about, hey, we can do this for you, but it gives people a really nice checklist for them to kind of go after and they gauge this on. And he's like, you'd be amazed at how many times he'll go into a house and they have just that section of the trifold brochure ripped off. It's up on their fridge. And they're marking off, yep, this spring I did this, this, and this, and this fall I did this, this, and this. And moving into the next spring, he's like, you know what? I want your help with this now. He says he's seen some of these were literally next to that checklist. They'll have, you know, to point number one, they'll have five checks next to it, which means they've had it for at least five seasons. And so, again, it's something that's value that people really hold on to. I need to work on my transitions, it looks like. So, another one. If you take a look at a direct mail, um, being able to lead with value on this and offering value up front. So, for example, it's a alarm company, and we've all seen those stickers and business windows and people's homes, um, you know, that our, our home is secured. So what we talked about doing is instead of doing a direct mail campaign of saying, hey, look at us, buy from us, we're great, talk about doing a direct mail campaign where we will actually mail out those stickers. Those stickers in bulk cost, I don't even think it's 40 cents, I think it's like 30 cents a piece. And people are able to put that into their window. Again, you lead with good solid value. With that sticker, it will help cut down on your chance of crime by like 72 or 73 percent. Even if you don't have a security system installed, you can cut it way, way down. 
the reason we do this is to be able to lead with value. So they can see this, they can understand this, um, and you give them something they can use and implement. So that way, three weeks later, when they canvass the neighborhoods, is that they will be able to see these stickers in their windows, and you have a extremely high chance, high sign-up rate with those individuals. The reason is they're already using or claiming to use your service. Um, they've already received value from you. And when you ask for a simple 20 bucks, 30 bucks a month, follow up on that to make sure you truly are secure. It's an easy, easy ask because you've already leveraged value on that front. Print ads. And one thing with print ads, and I know Beth works with this, um, is you take a look at one image, one call to action. And one image, one call to action. We do a ton of work in tourism. The one thing we joke about with most tourism entities is they try to put four or five photos into each single ad. Doesn't matter the size. Doesn't matter if it's full page, eighth of a page, anything in between. They try to cram as much information into it as possible. And a cluttered mind does nothing. So it's like the screenshot I have up above. But that ad, where do you focus? Where does your eyes even go? Again, a cluttered mind does absolutely nothing. So have one image, have one call to action, and you know, Nebraska Life is a perfect example, is if you are gonna run an ad one time in Nebraska Life and expect all these fantastic results, you're not gonna get it. What you wanna do is be able to be consistent and help tell that story, help lead people through that buying process, help them lead through those behaviors and how that works. It's not simply the best is trying to sell you, you know, four magazines or six magazines, it's simply in order for this to work, it's marketing. It's how we buy from people. It's how we build that relationship. You have to have, in today's marketing world, you have to have at least six to eight different touch points before somebody will trust you. Generally speaking, it's 10 to 14 touch points before they will buy from you. So again, it's all about frequency. It's not simply that I'm trying to sell you, you know, eight ads. It's in order for this to work, in order for the average person to go through their buyer's journey is you got to be hit on again and again and again and again. One other thing you kind of consider on this is affiliate marketing. In the last couple of minutes, I'll kind of close on a couple of additional ones. With affiliate marketing is where else are your buyers? We did work with a spa. And with a spa, her best buyers were a lot of times it was stay-at-home moms. And it needed to be able to get out of the house, you know, at least once a month, a couple times, or, you know, sometimes a few times a month. Well, what we ended up doing was teaming up with a Mercedes and BMW dealership. And we went to the salespeople at Mercedes, and we gave a free gift certificate of the spa. We talked to the salesperson. Hey, when somebody comes in and buys a brand new Mercedes or BMW or leases one, give them this gift certificate on class. It was a 30-minute something, I don't remember exactly, but a 30-minute true service. Not 10% off, not 20% off, but a, you know, a true service for 30 minutes. And so the salesperson loved it because you just bought a vehicle from them. Here's a way for them to give you a gift, you know, the, the new purchaser of the vehicle a gift. And then the ones that got it end up coming into the spa and they closed like 40 some percent of the people that came in. They led with value. They made the, uh, the salesperson look like a superhero by giving them something for free. And then they had such great service, they closed 40 percent of it. So think about where else are your buyers and how else can you attract and go after some of those buyers. So to close up, just a couple additional things that we learned. Long form copy works. Generally speaking, long form copy outperforms short form copy almost every time. You know, it's one of those common questions that people have. It's short, sweet to the point. Nobody reads them more. No one pays attention to it. And it's complete 100% BS. We've tested this again and again and again over the years. Almost every time, long form copy works. What happens though, it needs to be short and sweet. Um, each paragraph that is, one to two sentences tops per paragraph. Give them a lot of white space, tell them the story. What'll happen is at the very beginning of us reading something is we'll start scanning. We'll figure out if we're interested or not. It's real easy to scan if your paragraph is one sentence or two sentences and you have some good white space. Then once we decide that we do or we are interested, then we'll slow down and continue to read kind of the rest of this. So long form copy absolutely positively does work. What we've also done, I really need to update my uh, uh, transitions there, is we test a lot of things online. So again, going back to Nebraska Life, 
we have a client that comes to us, like, hey, we want to run an ad in Nebraska Life. So we take a look at, all right, the demographics in Nebraska Life are X. We go online. We ran these ad, ads to people that fit these demographics. What happened? What were the results? And the ones that fit the demographics is we take the best image from them and the best copy from them, and then we put that into the app. It's already been tested. It's already been kind of proven inside that market with those demographics and allows you to do a lot better job of making sure your marketing spend doesn't kind of go to waste because you know this image and this copy will resonate because, again, it's already been proven. So we segment it out by age, interest, demographic, and just make sure it's all a match. So. To close this up, and I don't know if Heidi will have any time for questions or not, but kind of close this up, a couple of takeaways. Be progressive in front of your audience. You know, allow them to quote unquote stumble upon you. Lead with value as you go through this. Make sure you do build an ecosystem. Um, and just gain some of those soft commits, some of those soft leads. Once you've gone through this process, then you can ask them to buy. But not until they've really kind of gone through that process itself. So I always close the presentations with the power of choice. One thing I love to be able to do is make an impact when it comes to marketing in the business. Uh, obviously, through this presentation here, ideally, you've gotten quite a few things you can really take and run with. It's your choice if you want to be able to take it and implement it. If you do choose to take it and implement it, please contact me and just follow up with me. Let me know how it went for you. I love hearing stories that, hey, I was able to do X, Y, and Z. and to be able to make a big impact on my business. I love those stories. And on the flip side of it too, I've got a few phone calls of, hey, you know, I tried this and it didn't work, open up the feedback. You know, but again, the uh, power of choice is yours and how much you want to take and really implement. With that being said, one thing I want you to definitely remember, since this is all about Grow Nebraska, always remember this, don't forget, Iowa is the worst state ever. Perfect, <laughs> that's what I have. There's my contact information again. Again, if you have any follow-up questions, definitely let me know. And Heidi, I do appreciate the, uh, the time that you've allowed me to, to share on here. Yeah, and thank you so much, Steve. This was an amazing presentation. And I know some of you are gonna have to jump off. We are nearing one o'clock, but I did wanna remind you, we are recording this training and we will be emailing it out to you afterward along with Steve's uh, contact information and a real quick survey that we'd love it if you filled out. Um, Steve, I'm going to try and go pretty quick because I know, I know people are busy and your time is valuable, uh, but we did have a couple of questions come through. Uh, one of them is if we have a new business and are just starting to dabble in marketing, wh where would you begin? Would you begin with making those touches on like social media? Would you begin with print ads? Where would you start? A lot of times I would start online and mainly the reason is, is that you can make an impact online for not a whole heck of a lot of money, especially if you know what you want to go after. And sometimes what we'll even do is start online to help identify certain audiences. And then once we identify certain audiences, it's like, okay, well, this audience also goes to this conference, also reads this type of magazine, also is receptive to X, Y, Z. A lot of times at the very beginning is kind of start online with that to be able to identify and even test some things out and then be able to move offline. Awesome. And if people are just getting started with paid ads, do you have uh, recommendations for how they can determine whether, say, on Facebook, if they should boost a post or if they should actually create an ad? How would you figure, go about figuring that out? So on Facebook, if you go to your Facebook fan page, uh, there's a button at the very top that says Insight. It's part of the menu. If you go to Insight, it will show you all the different posts you've written you know, over the last month, two months, whatever that time frame may be. What we take a look at, if we're going to boost something, is what were the most popular posts that you wrote about during that one-month process, two-week process. And what you want to do then is boost the most popular one. The reason is, is that if your audience really liked it, that means a new audience will probably like it as well. If you put a post on that you just didn't really resonate, that didn't get much traction on it, Facebook will look at that as being really low relevancy and just kind of a poor post, easier way to put it. So even if you put money behind it, they will not push it nearly as hard as they'll push a post that performed really, really well organically. So that's what we take a look at. 
Um, and then the other metrics that we really kind of watch without getting too nerdy in it is what is that cost per click to send them back to your website, back to you know, wherever you're trying to send them. It just kind of monitor that cost per click as well. Impressions are nice, but again, we want to be able to see the impact. We want to see who's clicking, who's doing what. So we kind of monitor that cost per click. Awesome. And then for those getting started with video, uh, how do you measure the success of a video? Is it if somebody interacts with it, like clicks on it, do they need to watch for at least like 30 seconds? How would you rate a video as successful? As a success? Good question. Yep, great question. Um, a lot of times for video, we're looking at simply how long is somebody watching the video. So if it's a five minute video, somebody watching for 50% of that, 75% of that, or just 10 seconds of that. So this goes back to even when I was talking about long form copy, is when we run a lot of this content for our clients, is we have them do longer form videos. We have some clients that actually do 60 minute videos on a weekly basis. Not asking anybody to do that unless you really, really love to and want to do that. But even some of our clients might do a 10 minute video. If somebody in today's day and age is watching half of that, five minutes, if they're spending five minutes with you online in today's day and age with so many distractions and everybody had a kind of a time crunch, that shows they're probably pretty damn interested in what you have to offer and what you're talking about. So for videos, I get much more concerned about video views and how long they're viewing your videos than clicks or anything like that. Because you can take a look at the length of those videos and people can then, um, or you can retarget to those people that have watched at least 50%, 75%, those type of things, the videos. And so that's what we really kind of focus on, much more than simply a click. It's a great way to get people into your ecosystem and passively they can you know, gather a bunch of value from you. Got it. And just starting out posting videos, would you recommend doing like Facebook Live or focus on like YouTube or does it really depend on your audience? I would go Facebook Live. Um, Facebook puts a lot of their own um, algorithm behind Facebook Live. So I'd go with Facebook Live, push that out there. Then I would download that Facebook Live and upload it to YouTube. So that way you kind of kill two birds with one stone. You'll probably get a lot more engagement off of Facebook itself than YouTube. However, YouTube is fantastic for YouTube searches, but also just uh, search engine optimization. Basically, you get higher Google rankings, those type of things. Awesome. Well, if anybody else has any questions, we do have the chat window open for you. Uh, but I do want to go ahead and thank all of you so much for taking some time today to join us for this webinar. Uh, if you enjoyed this training, uh, we do have, pull this up here, our next third Thursday training is actually going to be on how you can create packaging that sells. So we're bringing in Roy Noren from Performance Group, and he has been in the industry for about 20 years. He is amazing. So that's going to be on September 20th, and that is free and open to the public. You can register at GrowNebraska.org. And if you're interested in joining Grow Nebraska with your, your business, we do have special training opportunities just for members. So our next one is actually going to be on September 7th. So if you join before then, you can get in on this exclusive training. And you can join at grownebraska.org. And I also would like to ask you to save the date. Uh, April 3rd, 2019 is going to be our annual Market Tech Conference. And I, I absolutely love this conference. We've actually had Steve speak at this conference before. It's wonderful. And we are bringing in Amanda Bond from Canada. She is a Facebook ad strategist. So she is phenomenal. So do save the date for that. We will be opening up registration soon. Thank you so much, Steve. Shout out to Adams Bank and Trust for being our sponsor today. And shout out to Nebraska Life Magazine for being our featured business and for having a special offer for our members. So thank you, everyone. I hope you have a great day. And watch for that email coming from us soon. Thanks, Abby. Thanks.